Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Get in the Herd, a recovery podcast brought to you by the McShen Foundation. An award-winning recovery podcast. An award-winning podcast. recovery <laughs> podcast brought to you by the McShen Foundation. Uh, my name is Alex Bond. I am a person in recovery from substance use disorder, which means that I have not found the need to put any mood or mind-altering substances in my body in 15 months. And... Um, I'm here with my lovely co-host, Nathan Mitchell, as always. Hi. How are you doing, buddy? Dude, dude, I'm so excited to be on this show today. We've got a really freaking awesome show today. And I, I woke up this morning, and as as uh, Alex just reminded me, I set this up. I woke up this morning, and I saw that uh, a friend of ours was celebrating, and I saw... A little more than 15 months. A little more than 15, a little, yeah, just a, just a few 24 hours, right? Um, I'm very excited. Do you want to introduce... Yes, we have our <laughs> lovely recurring guest, Captain Recovery, uh, John Winslow, <laughs> celebrating 45 <laughs> years today. How are you doing, my friend? Uh, I'm doing good today, and I'm really excited to be on the show. Thanks for having me back. Having me back, yeah. You know what I like about your your recovery date? What's you that? have. I'm not yet 45. I'll be 45 in June. So you've you've been in recovery longer than I've been alive. I, I know this kid over here. You've been long, you know, but uh, isn't that but, a trip? That's a trip. <laughs> that's yeah. a trip to me too. You got you got uh, you found your recovery in 1976. Yeah, I was eight years old when I got sober. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Better too early than too late. <laughs> well, you know, so so I saw that you were celebrating today, and I asked, uh, you know. If, Asked the guys, you know, hey, should we ask John? And then Todd went right with it and asked it. And you, you were, you agreed to do the show. But what I really wanted to know was, how the heck you do that? How did you do this? Forty-five years. What keeps it fresh? Um, here's what keeps it fresh. I was on a uh, seven thirty this morning. Well, first of all, I woke up and I remembered who and what I am. Mm -hmm. Connected with my higher power, and I asked my higher power to help me stay sober today. And uh, and I did the rest of my my prayers and all. And then at uh, went for a, a, a early morning walk and uh, out under the, the. It was still dark. The stars were out, and it was very nice. I'm down here in Florida, so it's not like it was freezing cold. It was uh, a, a nice crisp morning. And uh, and then I came back, and I uh, I. Uh, Got something to eat, and then I hopped on a 7:30 a.m. Uh, meeting, 12-step uh, meeting, and it was a uh, it, it's a literature meeting uh, on this morning. Uh, however, there was a guy that that was on that we've never seen before. I stumbled across this meeting, was desperate to find a meeting. It was four days without a drink, and mm -hmm. um, and and was Jonesing, and and, uh, and so. Uh, and I commented to this at the at the meeting. One of the one of the guys um, suggested that we modify our plans rather than go with our regular format. We turn it into a first step meeting and support this guy. And it was just beautiful to witness that this guy talk about where he was at, and then everybody on board supported this uh, this young man, um, you know, in, in his recovery efforts. And so, um, and that's how I do it. I keep it green and I, you know, and, and, and that's the way it works. I stay plugged in, you know, they say, keep coming back, but it's other people say stay. And that's, uh, that's my commitment is to simply stay and, uh, and, and then pass it on to others. And so, uh, like as this morning, perfect example, newcomer coming on, keeping it green for men. Could you see yourself in him? And, and if so, how? I feel like every now and then uh, when, when there is a newcomer, someone with four days or, or four weeks, it's kind of like a, a check-in of exactly where I was at that point. And, and if so, how, John? Well, inter interesting. With this, with this meeting, it was, um, there were 12 of us, I guess. Myself and, and this young man included. Um, there were two women on the call, and uh, and everyone was white except for this young man that was calling in. And so, you know, I 
certainly look different from him. I don't know anything about his history background or, or anything. Uh, but the, the, I could see myself in him that he wanted it. I mean, he didn't share, you know, he didn't share a lot about where he was coming from other than that he was thirsty. He was really thirsty and he needed to find a meeting. And uh, so I don't know anything else about his history other than that. And he said that he had been in treatment, uh, you know, a, a while back and uh, had 60 days or so and went to a wedding and thought that he could try taking one drink. And then it was all two races again. So I could certainly identify with that, you know, that try and well, let me just try one drink. You know, I've done the white knuckle sobriety in the past. Um, you know, I'm not going to drink or I'm just going to drink a little or I'm just going to do some substances and, you know, some hard substances and nothing liquid or just do liquid and nothing else. And, you know, anything that I tried it always sooner or later, it, it ended up in disaster for me. So. And that, you know, that I, I didn't need to know a lot about his history other than he was, he wanted to not drink and he knew where to go. And thank God we were there for him and we gave him everything that we had. Mm -hmm. The only requirement, mm -hmm. you know, the only requirement, that desire. Yep. 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 Yeah, from a 12-step from a fellowship standpoint. John, got some qu big questions for you here. 45 years. 45 years in recovery, what, um, what's changed in 45 years? And I realize the show's about an hour or so, but what's well, changed, you know, for well, the better? I can, I can step away and look in the mirror and I can see one thing. That I <laughs> More I like an evolved. <laughs> there we go. Huh? More like evolved than changed. I yeah. like that, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. I hear some people at meetings say, you know, AA has changed so much. And I, you know, I, I, don't, I in certain ways, I, I guess it has. I know one of the things that changed is, you know, I was, um, I was what they used to refer to as a garbage head. You know, anything was going to get me high. It's like, yeah. A garbage I'll, head? I'll, a garbage head. You know, <laughs> I'll, take any, I'll take anything that you, you, you offer me. And, um, and, and so... Uh, when I came into the program, uh, there were there were. I'm going to try to do this without breaking any traditions. Um, there were no NA meetings uh, in my area. It was exclusively AA. NA was just coming into being, and um, there were um, there was no uh, basic text at the time. So at, at, and at and a meeting, everybody read from the big book, and wherever it said alcohol, they would just replace it with you know drugs. And um, but but at, at an, an AA meeting, uh, if you were to uh, have the misfortune or or be ignorant and mention the word drugs in an AA meeting back then, you better run for the door because you were gonna pretty much chase you out of there. You know, I saw some people really get changed. And and unfortunately, I mean, this was a change in times, but back then uh, there were like pure alcohol, many pure alcoholics. And so you were either in one camp or the other. And um, and and I saw some, some young people get shamed uh, at, in 12 step meetings because of their drug of choice and perhaps never return to any rooms. And so that was part of my commitment was to make sure I didn't do that to, to others. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that some of, the, some of the, 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 the terminology has changed, um, you know, the, uh, and I can't, well, I think of slogans, for an example, but, it's been a while since I tried this slogan out at an AA meeting. You know, we've got easy does and live and let live and but for the grace of God, things like that. You know, and, and then there's some some not so common slogans, one of which was um, that that we used to hear at meetings was you can pray for potatoes, but you've got to pick up the hoe. And uh, and Back when I first got sober, that had a certain meaning. 
Now, over time, that's something that's changed. So the last time I threw that out at a meeting, people started laughing, and it's like, what are they laughing? It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> could, could you repeat so, that so I can write that down? You can pray for potatoes, but... But you've got to pick up the hoe. And, but, you know, in other words, you know, you've got to do the work. You know, a shovel mm -hmm. or a hoe, you've got to hoe that row of, you know, to, to, to weed the garden is what that was referring to. But people understand it today in a whole, in a whole different context. So, like I say, some of the terminology, and, and, you know, has, has changed over time. You know, park bench to, to, uh, to Park Avenue from Yale to jail. You know, you know some of those kind of things that you just don't hear that much uh, and, and anymore. Um, it's, I was on a, uh, on a Zoom meeting uh, a couple weeks ago, and an old timer was on, and she threw out a bunch of lingo that I was just very familiar with hearing, you know, back in the day. And it was just uh, so soothing to hear somebody speak in that kind of language of, you know, the terminology that I, that I used to hear it brought back really fond memories. But in essence, the, uh, the, the, the program, I believe, has still remained uh, the recovery program through the 12 steps, you know, that that, that that has been essentially unchanged. Now, that also leads me to introduce the concept about multiple pathways, because mm -hmm. back in my day, there weren't any multiple pathways. There was one way and uh, one way or the highway. And so, you know, I'm, I'm pleased that I've even had an opportunity to play a part in expanding the recovery that we experience today to, to make room for any and all pathways to recovery. There's no wrong way to do it, is the way that I, that I view it. I support any and all pathways. So that is one thing that I think has very much changed over time. Yeah, I'd actually like to use that as a, as a good opportunity to talk about since since we're talking about the past and, and the last 45 years to uh -huh. look at the future in multiple pathways. Uh -huh. Do you think that um, cannabis could be a, a medically assisted treatment as as a multiple pathway to recovery? Yeah. Oh, sure, I do. Yes. Um, uh, yes, I do. You know that there. When, you know, I, my background is, uh, you know, I'm not just coming from the personal recovery background, but also my background, my career was in, in addictions treatment and, mm -hmm. and prevention and then ultimately recovery advocacy. Um, but back in the day, it's like, you know, the, uh, the concept of even uh, decriminalizing marijuana was an absolute no-no and the, the idea of legalizing the possibility of legalizing other drugs, et cetera, you know, absolutely not. And I was adamantly against it for the understanding back in the day that the more people that experimented, you know, that if, if they were, everything was legal and more people would experiment and just by sheer numbers, the more that experiment, the more not people, number of people that are going to become addicted. You know, I have different thinking to that these days, so I'm a lot more open-minded to the uh, to the possibilities. One of the, you know, there are many 12-step, uh, as well as other kinds of pathways to recovery. One of the newest that I was uh, introduced to the other day was uh, Chronic Pain uh, Anonymous, and uh, mm. you know, I know that there are many folks uh, that have uh, substance use disorders. And also have the dilemma of uh, chronic pain experience, and and, uh, and and a horrible dilemma for many folks. And and we've known countless people that have fatally relapsed as a result of uh, experiencing chronic pain. So, love to see new uh, opportunities being um, uh, proposed and and and, ex and explored uh, in this recovery uh, venture that we're in engaged in. Good, good stuff, John. Um, you mentioned that you've, you know, changed your thinking on multiple pathways through the through your career and through your recovery. Um, talk about a little bit of the recovery advocacy that you're doing now. What what do you do? What what keeps it 
going for you. And, and, uh, and, and, and if you want to do a, you know, shout out to what you and Alex have worked on that, that's awesome too. I, 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 I keep reminding Alex when we talk about last year, one of the cool things I think about what he's done is that, you know, he and you guys got the, the, uh, the uh, Niagara Falls to turn purple. And I think that's really cool. <laughs> that was, that was just, that was just the coolest thing in the world. And Alex, you know, just thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for all that you did to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to start to turn the, the world purple on September 30th. And so, um, yeah, as far as with my, my career moving from treatment into and, and prevention into recovery advocacy, it really began uh, or was expanded on <clears throat> as I was segueing from treatment into recovery. I had an opportunity to, to start one of the first recovery community centers in the state of Maryland. It was called Dry Dock mm -hmm. and Wellness Center. And it was a uh, combination of it was primarily substance use disorder of folks that we service, but it was also, it was broad. It was a uh, behavioral health uh, center. So people with mental health issues, as well as those with addictions were welcome to, uh, to, to come in and, and we supported everyone's recovery. Uh, peer, the peer, whole peer counselor was something that was very new in Maryland and I was blessed to be able to be uh, part of the pioneer uh, venture of getting the certification for peers and getting peers and hiring the first peers in the state in Maryland in our, in our center and, and start to do our outreach. From that, I um, from that as I was transitioning, I had and, and leaving state service, I had an opportunity to uh, to work with the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence (NCADD), uh, the Maryland chapter, and uh, was doing a, a wide variety of uh, recovery advocacy work through them. My my title was coordinator of the recovery leadership program, uh, but essentially I was you know I was uh, going down to Annapolis and, and providing some testimony, um, legislative testimony in support of recovery ventures. I, my, I, a big thrust of my interest was connecting dots of the recovery communities that were springing up all around our state and trying to see how we could connect with one another rather than being isolated pockets of there's dry dock recovery and wellness center. And then there's another new center that's down in Southern Maryland and something going on in Annapolis and so forth, how can we link them all together to sit and, and, and show that we're, you know, that there's really the strength in numbers, that there we're not just isolated. This is a we thing and that it's much bigger than one would initially imagine. From that, really, as, as I think you guys both know, it eventually led for me with my interest to really broaden that, not just beyond the state of Maryland and not just nationally, but on an international level to connect the dots of recovery communities all around the world uh, and all pathways of recovery and all addictions through this concept of International Recovery Day. So we had our launch this past September 30th and um, and we're looking to build that over time, and um, and, and I feel that it was very successful. One of the the uh, you know one of the great highlights was yes, uh, the getting the, the um, uh, Niagara Falls lit up on on um, International Recovery Day, and there were over a hundred Alex, right? There were over a hundred you know uh, structures and so forth. There were bridges, and there were skyscrapers, and there were Ferris wheels, and there were city halls and everything, not just in the United States, but, but around the world. One of the things that we had also it was a last minute arrangement was to light up the White House in purple on, on that date as well. And as it turned out, and without, without going into politics or anything, as it turned out, the, the, the day that it was, the evening that it was supposed to light up, it, there was a technical glitch. It did not light up. And it was very disappointing. However, the event still went on, and um, and so we're looking to now uh, look to the future and how can we build this. And I was just contacted, I think it was the day before yesterday, by um, and maybe it was just yesterday, by the folks in Ireland uh, who were asking me about you know what's the plan for this upcoming year, and um, and they were. Uh, you know, I was saying how, you know, I was very excited with the new administration that we have 
Uh, and, and you guys may be aware that there are some uh, folks in recovery that are in very high levels of this new administration, including mm -hmm. on a secretarial level and, 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 and otherwise uh, that are getting implanted. And, and, and so, uh, and with SAMHSA, uh, Tom Cordaire, for instance, was just, uh, just appointed by um, President Biden mm -hmm. to be a, 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 a assistant um, director or something along those lines. Uh, and, and other people uh, getting embedded in this new administration. So I was able to report back to the to our, our friend in, in Ireland that was inquiring about our efforts. And he said, well, you know, Biden is, uh, you know, his heritage is he's, he's, uh, he's Irish. And so, you know, they're very excited about that piece and the connection and their interest to continue to go on with the, uh, the efforts in Ireland. And I've not yet reached out to our other friends around the globe um, as yet, waiting for the dust to settle, as we know, all know that there was so much political stuff that was going on. Sure. You know, the dust is starting to settle now. And as that dust settles, we can reach out and, you know, to this new administration, we can develop to lay some plans, you know, for the future and, uh, and, and hope for the best, you know, um, it's going to be what it's going to be, and but I think that the, I think that the fire has been the the, the, the spark has been ignited, and so um, I'm looking very much forward to see what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, it's really wonderful to see such a um, large and positive idea actually taken forward and executed in such a successful manner, and I appreciate really being being a part of it, and it was you know, a real actual global effort. I mean, I know there are a bunch of places in Canada and Scotland, and it, it was just really cool to be a part of something what felt like so much bigger than me. And and for you to um, give me, you and Nathan, to give me that opportunity, that was really, really wonderful. Yeah, it's a, so, it's a, it's a, it's a we thing. And, and, and we ended up having one, the first year had 43 countries that were uh, at, at least 43 countries that were a part of this thing. So we can only grow. Yeah, absolutely. I think definitely maybe working toward like, I, I think um, before we get to Gwen's question that popped up, I did want to say that I think like one of the main hindrances is how recovery is treated in the media. And so I think something like that, which is such a positive thing, could use a lot more media coverage compared to every time something um, recovery is in the media. It yeah. feels like it's a an opioid crisis, a pandemic. People are dying. What do we do about it? And it's never like the spotlight of recovery that gets media coverage. It's always the negative of of the people dying, the mental health, the depression, all of the negative sides, and not the solution that gets the coverage. So I think maybe International Recovery Day, and as you were mentioning, the new administration could play a role in getting that positive media coverage. Alex, that's, that was the whole point was to, you know, we all know about the ravages of addiction. The point of this thing was to shift the focus from mm -hmm. the, 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 all the destruction that's out there with addiction to the positive aspect that there is hope out there. And so, you know, using International Recovery Day as a beacon of hope to folks and to work on reducing the stigma and focus on the positive rather than on the negative. Absolutely. And, and hopefully we, uh, we can continue to do that this year. Um, so Gwen has a question for you, John. She asked, um, what advice would you give to new folks who are navigating in a somewhat different model of recovery with, with you know, Zoom and the isolation a bit, et cetera? Um, man, I just, you know, so disliked the Zoom meetings. I haven't been to an in-person meeting. Uh, since this, you know, since for going on a year now, and um, wow. and, and I so much miss the hugs. Mm -hmm. I so much miss the handshakes to be able to somebody directly in the eyes. You know, they, they used to that that old adage that the eyes are the window to your soul. I did not want anybody to see my soul in my addiction, and I welcome to look people directly in the eyes these days. So, you know, I, I, I had to get over it, you know, and we all have, you know, for, for most of many of us. I mean, there are a number of old timers and people that aren't adept or didn't have the access that were really screwed. And there's been a lot of relapse as a result of this pandemic. 
But I said, you know, my brother used to say, go with what you got. So, you know, whatever resources they pour hopefully, you know, most folks do have some degree of, ac you know, of access to the internet over their phone or whatever, and so can access meetings online, take advantage of that, take advantage of the telephone, take advantage of the literature that is out there, um, work on building those relationships, the sponsorship relationships, or if there's other pathways, you know, things similar to that, take advantage of them. Um, but, you know, we, again, we just, we, uh, when I, not, not just speaking for myself, many of us out there in our active addictions, we were pretty adaptable to, you know, to the, to our surroundings and our environment. <laughs> so in recovery, if we can take some of those skills and apply them in a positive fashion, you know, we can we can be okay. Yeah, I, I like to think that the individuals who um, have found recovery now, you know, in the last what oh, almost a year, yeah, are are really um, are we okay? Okay, sorry. Uh, in the last year, are really getting a, a really good jump on on feeling their feelings, you know, in a, in a very compressed way. I think I think if you get a year, if you get a year of continuous sobriety in the past year, it's really more like four. <laughs> I know this is the new recovery for some people that they you know this is all that they know, and some people are just you know have really adapted to the uh, the Zoom meetings and they're just loving it. Yeah, I, I haven't fully, I haven't fully adapted to the Zoom meetings. You know, I I, I confess, and uh, and it's funny because my medium here is is often you know yeah. here online, but you know oh. I find myself at meetings with my, you know where I wouldn't if I were sitting in a meeting you know with people live, I would never in a million years think to sit on my phone. I know some people will do that and whatever, but you know I I, I don't I wouldn't sit on my phone, but I'll find myself in a Zoom meeting, just kind of like oh what's going on in the world, and picking up my phone and having to retrain myself you know fortunately i think here you know where we are in richmond we've had um a lot of meetings have closed down or have gone virtually but there's still enough uh live one-on-one -on -one, you know or you know live in-person meetings mm -hmm. that uh, i've been able to get my fill and and yeah get my get my recovery on yeah, we still have about two a day here in this building right yeah, now. yeah yeah mm -hmm. We do actually. That's right. I forgot about the date, the, the noon meeting. So, mm -hmm. well, and, and with that, you know, also that they're capping it out. So they're following the protocol. Mm -hmm. It's you know, if, if it's too full for one, if it's too full for one meeting, then they carry over to a different part of the building. So there's distance, just so our viewers and listeners know that there is protocol. It's being no, you know absolutely. being followed. So. Yeah, and and kind of as as y'all were mentioning, like as you were mentioning, John, my um, you know. I know people in recovery, I think my sponsor being one of them, who said that he actually prefers the Zoom model, that, uh -huh. that actually has like been able to step away and work with the Zoom model even better because of the accessibility to it. The fact that there is literally, you know, dozens, maybe even hundreds of meetings going on at the exact same time. So if I, I want to find a meeting, there's probably 12 different ones that I could find going on at any point in time. If I don't like that one, I can try a different one. I can try a different one. I can kind of just keep bouncing around until I find one that I like. I needed a meeting one night and I ended up getting on a, on a meeting in Zurich, Switzerland. And, uh, <laughs> See, and that's another, awesome. Yeah, another one in Australia. It was a hybrid meeting. The first hybrid meeting that I went to was in uh, Australia. Yeah, and I think it's wonderful that we're, we're able to connect on such a larger scale because of that. Uh, um, you know, I still prefer the in in person meetings, but I see the massive benefits of it. I got to speak at a meeting. It was the first time I was I was asked to speak at a meeting, and it was um, my cousin's home group in San Francisco. Completely wow. different, like completely different layout of the meeting and how it was structured, kind of like how you were saying. A, um, a completely different demographic. And it was it was like, I felt like I was in person. Everyone was a lot more liberal as one would expect than in Virginia. But it was so refreshing to have this kind of like, I don't know, other world exposed to me, which I feel like can happen when you go to a Zurich, Switzerland meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Was, it, was the meeting in English in Zurich? 
it was in English. Yeah, I was uh, I was searching for and, and and looking online. wasn't that hard to find those that were um, that were English speaking meetings. And and what I needed was something that would was compatible with my time zone. So I used um, my uh, my Alexa to help you know tr figure out you know if it's eight o'clock here, where is it going to what you know what meeting would be available to me and you know, whatever part of somewhere in Europe. <laughs> That's so, so John, 45 years. Tell us about, um, if, if you don't mind, uh, tell us about the, the journey over the 45 years and, 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 you know, maybe talk about, um, some of the moments where, uh, your, maybe your sobriety might've been, you know, close to being compromised and how you overcame those, mm. those moments. And, you know, and, and keep in mind that, that our, our listenership, it turns out, um, is pretty, pretty broad in the, uh, uh, uh pretty broad. Uh, we, we, what, 92,000, 96,000 individuals, um, incarcerated individuals, you know, are getting hope from these um, hopeful messages. Yeah. And then also, I mean, the, the podcast part itself. So yeah. on the audio part, I looked at it yesterday and it was like, you know, primarily we're in the United States, but then we've, we're also in Canada, Brazil, Brazil. Say, like, Obrigado. you know, over in Europe. I can't remember all the countries in front of it, but there was like, you know, 10 different countries that people were listening to the to the audio part. Really? Of it. Yeah. So I thought that was really exciting. <laughs> so, Truly international yeah, reach there. John. Yeah, yeah. 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 Very. That is very cool. So, so you know, keep your yeah. message limited to the Brazilians. <laughs> So, so challenges in, in recovery. Um, uh, early on, I was um, when when I first got sober, and part of what um, prompted me to to get into recovery, I was madly in love with this woman. That uh, <laughs> surprisingly, believe it or not, she was also an alcoholic. And, and a drug addict. Um, we met in a bar. And I was crazy in love with her, um, and uh, and I knew that if I didn't get my act together, I would blow her chip like I had blown my marriage. <clears throat> so I I did. I got into recovery. If you guys are familiar with Father Martin's Chalk Talk, and, oh yeah, um, I, uh, yeah. Well, Father Martin was in my area, and and um, his uh, his partner that started Father Martin's Ashley May uh, May. Um, was the sponsor to my girlfriend and uh and, and um she and father took her up and got her into a detox and she got into recovery and uh and they was sponsoring her and and it was um just uh such a tumultuous time for me because of the strain of you know two as they say two sickies don't make a well and, <laughs> and, and we, we both fit the fit the bill on that and uh and it was really a struggle in that first year and, and you know me trying to stay sober and her trying to get her act together and you know i was so looking forward to my first anniversary and um thinking about the you know just the all the people that are going to be there and i'm going to be there with my honey and we're both going to be sober and life is going to be so good and and all that and it was that my first anniversary was maybe the most painful 24 hours that I've had in my recovery. It was not working out between me and my honey, and it did not work out between me and my honey. And, and my commitment needed to be to, you know, putting my recovery before any and all else. And along those lines was also the relationship with my daughter, who was five years old when I got sober. I would take her to some meetings, so my, my wife and I had become divorced and 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 so uh, I was the weekend daddy and uh, and when I the times that I had her would take her you know if I needed to get to a meeting she would go with me to meetings and and there was a, a lot of pain and, and struggle and, and emotional strife that was connected to that and again I, I recognized I knew intuitively that if I didn't put my recovery above any and all else i couldn't be there if it did work out for my you know my girlfriend and me. i couldn't be the dad that i wanted to be if i wasn't sober you know there would be no chance and so 
there were a lot of consequences of, uh, 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 as a result of that, not all positive. And, and just bringing it up to, in terms of challenges and what major challenges, bringing it up to the present and this past week or so, that, um, you know, I've had some challenges along those lines that were um, some of the most difficult and, um, uh, and, and, and hurtful, painful um, challenges that I've had in my recovery uh, with stuff that's going on with family. And, um, and, 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 and yet my commitment has and remains strong that I've got to prioritize my recovery. I've got to put that first, not apologize for it, draw, stay plugged into my program, draw upon all my resources. So um, calls into my, here I am with 40, coming up on 45 years, you know, a couple of days ago, and I'm making the calls to my sponsor and I'm reaching out to my higher power and I'm plugging in and sharing with, at the meetings, you know, in a general way of what's going on in my life to uh, to gather that support and help me get through this uh, this crisis. Um, fortunately, I've not been, I, I haven't gotten thirsty or no state of thinking has come in yet, um, but I'm still an addict, I'm still an alcoholic. That could happen in any, that could happen in the course of our communication here where I could get thirsty all of a sudden. So. I stay plugged in and I, I, and I draw on, I keep it basic and draw on all my resources and it gets me through the thick and the thin. It has for 45 years and so I'm trusting that it will, again, uh, it's uh, going on three o'clock or so between now and whenever I lay my head down tonight, as long as I haven't picked up today, I've had a damn successful day and I've been mm. grateful for every day that I've had no matter what's going on. And I would also say, having shared those challenging moments and those difficult moments in my life, I've had many joys and blessed by many joys and happinesses and good things and, and, and wonderful people in my life, wonderful experiences in my life. I was riding my bike this morning out for a bike ride, and I came face to face with a coyote. And, um, and you know, we had a standoff for a while. I was able to video him. And I, I guess he was looking for the road runner. There was a beep beep going on. And, uh, you know, you never know what life is going to bring. So I, I look for the adventure. I look for the joy. I didn't even know there were coyotes in Florida. What part of Florida are you in right now, John? The Gulf Coast, uh, just below Tampa. Oh, okay. My, my dad lives down in – and I used to live down in Naples. So, so a little yeah. bit south of you. Yeah. Cool, cool. Coyotes. That yeah. is cool. Wiley wow. Coyotes. <laughs> yeah. John, we were talking about uh, your, your experience. So with 45 years clean, that, that comes a lot of experience. And I, I appreciate you sharing um, that one in particular with us. And, and I wanted to ask, that sounds like a, um, a trial and error scenario where, you know, getting into a relationship as a newcomer, not always a good idea, but you had to do it on – you had to do it to find out, kind of how I did in, in getting into recovery. I, I needed to make my own mistakes so that I could have that desperation to come into the room. That's, that's my story, at least. My question to you is, um, is that how, how it has to be done a lot of times? I mean, I know for me, it does. Um, I guess my, yeah, my question is, is this a trial and error process or can a lot of this be avoided? <laughs> well, it, it's, it's, it's up to the individual, I think, that it can be a trial and error uh, experience. Now, just to, just to clarify a little bit, I was already in this relationship with this woman, you know, when, when we got, when, when I entered into the rooms and, and, and then shortly after she, she entered into the room. So it wasn't a, a, a romance that started after, after the fact that was, you know, back in, in, in active addiction. Um, so, um, yeah, some of this is, is trial and error. Um, you know, they say, uh, they, they say that pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Mm. And I, in, in essence, I, I believe that. And I would much rather, much rather learn from Alex's mistakes 
and Nathan's mistakes <laughs> than from John's mistakes. And sure. So, so that's what I, you know, I try to keep my ears and eyes open, listen to my sponsor, listen to the GOD that, you know, that, that, that folks offered me, you know, the old times, old timers offered me, but, you know, as I'm working with a new guy right now, and we had a conversation the other day is about free will, you know, my higher power gives me free will and I can do the trial and error thing all day long if I want to, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but I've had enough friggin' pain in my life. I would rather just, uh, you know, um, you know, pay attention and, uh, and and check things out before just plunging into something. If, for, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's what came up for me. The, well, the first sure first thing I think, John, when you when you're just talking about your your response or your the newcomer you're working with, for after all, God gave us brains to use. I think I'm I think I'm quoting from the Big Book. Yeah, and and I, I think of that a lot because, you know, I, I want to sit back and do nothing sometimes. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, no, actually I actually have to put some action into it, mm. you know, into my own recovery. Yeah, what's what's uh, what's bubbling up for you guys? What's bubbling up, Todd? Well, no, I'm just thinking that, you know, like 45 years, that's a, that's a long time. And, you know, Alex had asked the question about, you know, trial and error. So, you know... <clears throat> Obviously, with trial and error, that would mean you would get close to the edge. Uh. So do you think, if looking back and reflecting on your 45 years, do you think that you've had a mixed bag where it's been 50-50, where you've had to consciously, you know, think about your recovery every day, or has it gotten easier as the time has gone on that you don't necessarily, oh, well, you know, when you pass a bar, or you pass, you know, has that has that subsided as time has gone on? I think that's a great question, especially for the for the newcomers. My experience is that it is a hell of a lot easier to stay sober than it was to get sober. Mm -hmm. a, a hell of a lot easier. Um, and uh, um, but you know, and, and this is just my get my experience my experience is is that you know i was given the, the, the gift of desperation and and i when i came into recovery i just turned 26 years old and and i knew that my way was not going to work and that i needed to throw myself into this program you know and for a dime and for a dollar i got to go in all the way literature so some recovery literature says half measures availed us, not even half. Half of half <laughs> measures availed us. Nothing is what they said. So I, so being young, it's like if I'm going to do this thing, I got to go all the way with this, and that's what essentially that's what I have done. And I and I I really plugged in. I joined a home group, got a sponsor, worked the steps, found a higher power. You know, blah blah blah. Did, did all those things and I have stayed plugged in and I have, um, you know, my cravings went away almost right away and I have, uh, I've not gotten thirsty. I had one incident. I was sober, I don't know, maybe, I don't, four years, something like that, four or five years. One, one evening or one day, sometime during the day, um, I, Suddenly, I was doing some schoolwork and sitting on a bed doing some work and on a paper, and the thought of smoking some hashish came to mind. It's like it's overpowering. <laughs> Man, I can just I can taste it, that peppery kind of whatever you know oil thing, um, and I just wanted to you know take a hit off some some, some hash, a bomb. So I, who knows where that came from? Fortunately, I was really plugged in with my lots of meetings, sponsorship, all those other things, and knew what to do and, you know, and, and it went away. Um, aside from that, I've not gotten thirsty. I've not, you know, felt like I, you know, I felt feel like I've really stayed in the center of the pack and, and been stable with my recovery. But I want to keep it that way. I've seen so many people over time that got away from their recovery pathway and, and got into major, major problems. A number of them got really squirrely, got back into their recovery program and got squared away, but so many others that, uh, that never made it back and, and, and oftentimes fatally, you know, were fatal results. 
Mm. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know, it's tricky over time. Like, I, even I still get cravings every now and then if I'm like watching a movie or something like that. But it's more of a matter of like, at what point do I stop the fantasy? I, I think is is what it is. It, it just becomes fantasizing, and then well, that's what I call it. When really, in all actuality, it's an obsession. Right. And I and I knew that if I if I permitted myself to entertain those kind of thoughts, there was a huge likelihood that I would end up using again. So I learned to just nip those thoughts in the mm -hmm. bud the instant they arose. Mm -hmm. No, that's good advice. Uh, and I, I guess. Um, you know, we got we got still a little bit more time here, but I, I want to make sure that I ask you what would be like the ultimate advice you could give to a newcomer, like someone, someone. I know, I know that's kind of like a loaded question because ideally you just give them the book and say read that. But if you could, if you only had the opportunity to give uh, the ultimate cliche or, or bit of advice to a, a newcomer, what would it be? You know, they, they um, you know, in, in the 12 step world, we talk about honesty, open mindedness, and willingness. And, um, you know, and, and I, and each as the, you know, the, the cornerstones to recovery. And, and each of them are so critically important, I, I believe. Um, Open your heart. Hmm. Seek out a power greater than yourself. I mean, alcohol and other substances were clearly, I couldn't stop on my own. They were clearly a, a power greater than me. And so I need a, a power greater than me, a power greater than alcohol and other substances. And so I pursued a search for a, 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 a higher power. Um, so, I, and that can be experienced in many, many different ways. So go to your truth, open your heart, open your mind, open your soul, go to your truth, follow that truth. It's hard to know how you can go wrong if you're doing that. I appreciate that. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, what uh, you you had and you had this opportunity this morning um, with your with your newcomer in, in the meeting and what how how do you think um, how how does it okay this is my question you know in a in a one you know when a in a in person meeting you know of course the hugging you know that's and that's a, a big thing that I've grown to not miss <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, uh, but that's, I realized I don't actually like being touched as much as I, as I thought I did. And it's like, you know what? I kind of like this. Um, <laughs> um, and that, that might be because I'm a shorter guy and I tend to smell a lot of armpits. Um, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's, it's a big fact. I, I talk about how grateful I am for deodorant every time I hug a tall person, but you're hugging the wrong people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I'm kidding. <laughs> maybe I am. Maybe 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 we need to talk, Alex. Um, you're tall too. Oh but, no. Yeah, but without that connection, you know, and through Zoom, how are people exchanging information? So did did, and and you know, I've been to twelve step meetings. You know, I, I have a twelve step fellowship. I work as well. And in some meetings, often the newcomer gets you know they pass around a, 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 a hearing IP or something. Yeah, well, an IP, I guess an NA and AA. It's a, a, a how and uh, how and where and why or whatever it is little uh, book or meetings and stuff um yeah i forget what it's called now that's how long we we did that with this guy what we did, did okay. is is that you know people started you know through the chat it started the the guys started putting out their phone numbers and Good. You know, we let the guy know that there that, that there was a meeting at 7 30 a.m every day of the week keep coming back use the phone numbers we talked about getting a sponsor we talked about the book living sober and the, you know tips on daily living you know that there were a lot of things that we were able to do through the zoom that uh that could be done you know at a, a regular in-person meeting how long did it take for you to make a decision to turn your will over 
And what I mean by that is how many meetings or, you know, how long were you uh, introduced to recovery before, you know, it, it stuck for 45 years? My, my very first AA meeting, I was, uh, I was a two-year resident in a psychiatric unit at a VA hospital. Hmm. And, that's, and they took me out to my very first AA meeting. I didn't want any parts of Alcoholics Anonymous or anything <laughs> like that. I want to hear about God. I can't oh, yeah. I wasn't, I, I wasn't that bad. You know, they were going home and sleeping in their beds. I was going back to the nut house. I wasn't that bad, so I thought I had to drink and drug for another year. Um, but when I this and and so I drank for another year, and then I crashed and burned, head-on collision, and all that stuff. And and within a week, found myself in in a very twelve-step oriented rehab, and was there for twenty-eight days. And while I was there and listening to their lectures on higher power and the group shares and all those kind of things, I went into my room and I got down on my knees. I was an agnostic at the time. And I just said, you know, hey, if, there, if you're out there, please help me. Please help me. And I began to discipline that. And I was a very undisciplined person, as we typically are. Um, but I began to discipline myself with that on a daily basis, the basics of please and thank you. Please help me. Mm -hmm. Not used today. Thank you. I laid my head down. Thank you for helping me get through the day, and not and, and I didn't use today. Um, yeah. Is that is that a, a similar pattern? What you did then does that work for you now as well? That's what I did this Please, morning. Thank you. That's yeah. what I did last night before I went to sleep last night. That's what I did the first thing when I got up this morning. It's I've heard it said that if it works. Don't fix it. If you don't leave, yeah mm -hmm. if you don't leave the basics you don't have to go back to the basics yeah yeah i like that because i i i have a similar routine you know and my my morning and then i did not come into the rooms you know the recovery sphere with the uh, idea that hey i'm gonna choose a god of my understanding and and that's gonna fix my problems i i said no 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 there's no god out there and certainly if there is he doesn't like me mm. Um, and to, to realize that uh, there is something greater than myself and I don't have to know what it is. I just have to, you know, subscribe to a, something that is better than me and wants something good for me, you know, has been really helpful in my understanding as it, as it evolves. Hey, I was at a, I was at a 12 step meeting um, last Sunday. It was a meeting that I had started a dozen or so years ago. And, um, and it's a God as I understand the meeting where we talk about, how it is it that we understand God? And the guy that was, I think it was the guy that was leading the meeting, or maybe it was just the guy that, sh that shared at the meeting, said, I don't believe in God. And my thought was, how wonderful is that, that we, that I can be a part of this movement where the topic is God as I understand him, and somebody can proclaim, I don't believe in God, and he's staying sober, and nobody's saying, you can't say that. You can't do that. You know, that's <laughs> wrong. You have to do this or, you know, none of that stuff. It's like, yeah, it's working for him. Uh, the, the freedom to allow others to be who they are and not let it affect me. I yeah. it's, it's a, a lot, get a lot of comfort for that. Yeah, it's a really optimistic way to look yeah. at it. So, so we're, we're coming on the hour and John, I, 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 uh, I, I want to ask what you see as um, the challenges we face, you know, in the recovery movement, in the recovery advocacy movement going forward, and and the successes that you see around the corner. What what do you see? And I I, I also work a, a program that requires me to stay in a one day at a time thinking mode. Um, so it's I, I don't like to look so far into the future. I don't know how. I haven't quite reconciled how my goal setting, you know, and my one day at a time goes. That's you know, it's still a new thing for me to set goals and accomplish them. Um, but now in the recovery advocacy sphere, you know, I do that a little bit myself. How do you do that? What do you see going forward for the movement? Well, I I I, I hope that you know our, our 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 nation has been, as we all know, has been in a huge state of flux, and there has been huge divisiveness and um sometimes it even comes into the rooms that's a rarity 
Um, but outside uh, issues. <laughs> outside, absolutely, out, out, outside issues has has no place. Um, and and so I, you know, that there there needs to be a, a, a great healing in our nation, and there needs to be a healing in for many of us within our within our hearts, and. And, and so I, I hope that I can say this in a way that doesn't offend or turn anybody off. Um, but with the, this new administration and with people getting in, embedded that, that have long-term recovery, that are getting embedded in the administration, you know, at, at high levels, of, as I mentioned early on, and that are going to get embedded in the recovery component. You know, we've got the, the ONDCP, Office of National Drug Control Policy. Mm -hmm. We used to have a, uh, a drug czar that was in re the first one, Michael Botticelli, first drug czar that was himself and a gay man in recovery that led that organization. And that changed. And it one of the, you know, this re had it went away and so my belief is with uh the, uh, with the, the the change of guard and the new people that were coming in not just you know in just high levels of government but into the recovery aspect of the administration i think that it is going to be very exciting times very promising very healing very hopeful uh, a lot of good things can happen as we move forward. That's good. Who needs a drug czar? We should have a recovery czar. That's they have it. They have recommended that they change the name. That's perfect. From drug czar to recovery czar, and I hope that they do that. And let's advocate for that also. I think that's a great idea. Um, Say congratulations again to you, buddy. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations, John. Forty-five years—that's a lot of twenty-four hours, man. Congratulations, and thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, I look forward to seeing what you guys, the two of you guys, light up this year. Um, and I, I, I want to ask uh, one other, la one last quick question: Is there anywhere um, a picture of the Ni of Niagara Falls in purple? Is that on the website somewhere? Can I get a picture of that? I think there's a picture on the website. Of I'm gonna. We'll talk offline. I'm gonna. I, I want to hunt that down. Do some digging. <laughs> I want. I want to print that out for uh, this young man right here because I think that's. A, I think that is one of the coolest things, man. The two of you worked so hard and put together such an amazing event last year, and and to go with it, 40, 43 countries. Yeah, that's that's. Amazing, and, and 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 with no budget or very little budget, you know, and to be able to put so many people together, you know, you gave me, you know, I I'll, I'll be honest when 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 John Schinholzer said, "Hey Nathan, uh, you should look at it, talk to this guy John Winslow," and I said, "Oh man, I'll make a bunch of phone calls." <laughs> I found somebody to to be an intern, <laughs> and I sloughed off the work to somebody else, and you guys really kicked it out of the park, man. You knocked it out, kicked it out of the park. I'm playing kickball here. Knocked it out of the park, man. That that that's just incredible, and I I have a lot of hope for that. So, thanks again. Forty five years. Funny how higher power works. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I love. I love it. Um, Absolutely. I, I, we just really appreciate having you on, John. Thank you, Nathan. It's always a pleasure. Shout out to Todd, the producer, Woo! as always. <laughs> um, John, here's to uh, 45 more, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> All right. I love you, man. And uh, this has been Getting the Herd. Peace out. Peace. Uh, my name is Shannon Lance. I'm currently here in recovery at McShin Foundation. Uh, I got out of jail on January 10th, 2021. And while I was incarcerated there, uh, my mother passed away to, due to COVID uh, complications on December 14th. Uh, it, was, it was a really challenging event in my life. Uh, while I was incarcerated there, I, 
I watched the recovery videos and the podcast on the tablets there, uh, you know, that was made by the McShin Foundation. Getting to her podcast is really made me feel like I was a part of something on the outside because, you know, there's people that are commenting and just seeing, you know, people that I was incarcerated with uh, on the videos and just thinking, man, you know, that's that's going to be me, you know, before too long. And, you know, I'm going to be sitting there in them rooms and, you know, be able to be a part of the podcast and getting the herd series. And, you know, now I'm a part of the herd here at McShin and it's, it's an amazing feeling and it's, it's nice having a, a fulfilled sense of hope in my life currently and uh, just to live one day at a time and just to have positive feelings in my life and good relationships with you know my family and friends is uh is an amazing event